some scheduling. I want to remind folks that tonight at five o'clock we will be conducting a primary care advisory group meeting. Um, the instructions for call-in are on our website, on um, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board website. I also wanted to let fo folks know that we're adding um, a, uh, an agenda item for next week, and it's going to be really um, interesting. It's a paper that recently was published. I actually don't think it's officially published yet. It's out of um, NESCO, which is a New England consorti state consortium group. And what they've done is they've studied primary care spend throughout six New England states. And the authors of that paper are coming to present to us next uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, we have a meeting starting at 10 a.m. And um, I also want to give a shout out to our own Michelle Degree and Lindsay Kill, who are also participants in that study. Um, we'll also be hearing next uh, Wednesday morning from Sarah Lindbergh on um, the 2021 benchmark. And then we have an afternoon meeting as well. Um, next Wednesday afternoon, and um, we will be discussing um, provider reimbursement. We have a panel and staff uh, discussion on that. I um, also just urge folks to check our, our website and our press release as we have um, added a couple of additional meetings, um, including the Prescription Drug Technical Advisory Group. Um, the other thing I want to remind folks about is we and the group, the, the staff will discuss this today after they present the um, staff recommendations on the 2021 uh, ACO budget, but our public comment period uh, is open until December 21. Um, we plan on having a vote on this budget on December 23rd, so we urge you to submit comments uh, for consideration of the board. And that is all I have to report back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, December 2nd. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 2nd, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries unanimously. So the the uh, um, really the majority of the agenda today is taking a look at the um, staff analysis and recommendations um, when it comes to the accountable care organization. And um, we're going to hear from a number of members of staff. So I'm going to turn it over now to Elena to introduce all her colleagues and um, take us through the presentation. So Elena Barabee. Great, thank you, Kevin, or Chair Mullen. Um, so today I'm going to share the slides. As Kevin mentioned, we will be walking through um, the ACO's budget and staff recommendations. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting how to display a full screen. Ah. Full screen mode. Thank you. Okay. Um, so today, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm Elena Barabee, Director um, of Health Policy um, at the Green Mountain Care Board, and I have with me Marissa Melamed, Michelle Degree, Sarah Tewksbury, um, Kate Hoffman, and you know we also received help from the GMCB analytics team. So this is really a um, full board effort. Um, a lot of great insights and great teamwork um, to come up with these recommendations. Um, you know, I do want to let you know that this is really these recommendations today are based on the information that we have received. Um, so as you're hearing kind of the analysis and our recommendations. If there is additional information that would help um, the board kind of formulate its decision on a vote, you know, please do let us know. We're happy to follow up um, um, as needed. Uh, so as Susan mentioned as well, there are other relevant pieces to this conversation that will be 
um, kind of discussed at the next board meeting as it relates to Medicare benchmark and some other um, more up-to-date information. So, you know, this is just a foundation and I think we can continue to build um, as we learn more. So um, the agenda, we're gonna go through ACO oversight, a little bit of the background, uh, certification, eligibility, verification, and then we'll talk about the budget review and go through through that process, the 2021 recommendations, um, discuss next steps, and then open it up for questions and public comment. Um, these are a list of acronyms that you can reference throughout. We tried to spell things out where appropriate, but um, so we can kind of um, not get too wordy in our slides. You know, this is here for reference for anyone who may need it. Um, ACO oversight con consists of two primary processes. The first is certification. So this occurs one time um, and then annually we go through the eligibility verification uh, process to ensure that um, the ACO continues to meet all of the requirements of the certification. Um, and then what you know, we will spend most of our time talking about today is the budget review. Um, and this occurs annually at the start of the program year um, with payer contracts and attribution finalized in the spring. So there is still that um, kind of delta that we expect to resolve um, in the next couple of months. So I think we showed this last year there, you can kind of see the trajectory um, of the process. Um, GMCB issues the budget guidance in July, the ACO submits certification in September, and then their budget in, in October. Um, the ACO came in for a budget hearing October 28th, um, and then we followed up with um, some questions based on the budget submission as well as the hearing and um, have used those questions and the budget um, submission to uh, produce this analysis. So uh, the board vote um, should happen by the end of the year. Um, I think believe it's scheduled tentatively for the 23rd. Um, and then we would work to you know, construct the budget order in January or February. Um, and then in spring, as I mentioned before, we'll look at the final contracts and attribution. And then ongoing monitoring occurs, occurs throughout the year um, as a result of the budget order. And public comment, as, as Susan indicated, is accepted throughout. You know, I think if we do want public comment to influence or kind of be considered in the um, staff analysis and final recommendations that we will bring back before the board, um, you know, I believe that is by December 21st. So it'd be great to have those comments in by then. Now I will turn it over. Thank you, Elena, for kicking us off. My name is Marissa Melamed. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I think that's a yes. Thank you. Sound check. Um, again, my name is Marissa Melamed, uh, Associate Director for Healthcare Policy with the board. I'm going to walk you through the uh, certification eligibility, eligibility verification uh, for FY21. So OneCare was certified in 2018. Uh, continued eligibility for certification is verified annually. OneCare remains certified unless and until its certification is limited, suspended, or revoked by the board. If uh, the Green Mountain Care Board determines that OneCare is failing to meet one or more certification requirements, it may take remedial action, uh, including requiring OneCare to implement corrective action plan. Over the past several years, we have worked to align the timing and process of certification verification with the budget review uh, because of the overlap in criteria. We issue a certification eligibility verification form in July along with the budget guidance and the form is due back in September to give us a jump on the review in anticipation of the budget submission that we receive the following month. The form verifies that the ACO continues to meet the requirements of 18 BSA 93, 82 and rule five and it describes in detail any material changes to the ACO's policies, procedures, programs, organizational structures, provider network, health information infrastructure, or other matters addressed in sections 5.201 through 5.210 of the rule uh, that the ACO has not already reported to the board. As I mentioned, a lot of the materials overlap. We use, but we use the budget to help us verify the criteria as well as the certification form. And all certification verification materials as well as budget materials are posted on our website um, at the link on this slide. You can go to the next slide. Oh, 
next slide. Is mine not caught up? It should be slide eight. Uh, it should be slide eight. I'm not seeing it on my on the screen, but if everybody else is, I'll continue. Um, there are 16 statutory criteria for certification in section 9382 that crosswalk to the 10 sections of rule 5.0. The Green Mountain Care Board monitors that the ACO meets these criteria. The certification is primarily a policy review. Earlier or more frequently, as policies are reviewed and updated by One Care, staff re um, review new and updated policies relevant to these sections. Um, and we're going to go through those in the following slides. We collect the policies annually, quarterly, or as soon as they're approved by the One Care Board of Managers as needed. You can go to the next slide, which should be slide nine. For some reason, I'm not seeing. I'm still seeing slide seven on my screen. Yeah, we're up to nine. nine. It's just your side. Okay, something. Well, I'll keep talking because I have another version, but I'm doing the wrong thing. Hopefully, it'll catch up. Um, so on slide nine, um, we have structured our review um, into this table. It's broken down by sections of the rule. So for each section, the key criteria are summarized in the second column. The ongoing monitoring and reporting documents we collect are listed in the third column and our staff conclusions and any additional monitoring recommendations are listed in the fourth column. So I'm gonna go through these um, as, as efficiently as possible because there's a lot of information in here. Um, so the first couple sections, 201 to 2.3, concern the um, legal governing body, leadership and management. Um, the key criteria from the rule are boiled down there in that second column. Um, the third column, again, those are the um, documents that we collect and review each year. Um, this year, we didn't pick up, we didn't find anything new. Um, so we continue to monitor these documents. There is um, an updated conflict of interest policy that will be um, reviewed in quarter four. Under solvency and financial risk, uh, 5.204. Again, I'm not gonna go through each one of these documents. I'll skip to the um, staff conclusions and additional monitoring. Um, a couple things um, that we added there this year. So, um, so in the third column, you see that we collect a financial audit, um, annually, quarterly financial statements. We also review their finance committee charter. Um, one thing that we've been discussing and you'll see in last year's materials is um, a legal and financial vulnerability assessment um, under this section. Um, some of that can be reviewed through the financial audit. However, these audits are not timely. Um, we should be receiving the 2019 audit this month. Um, so they're about a year, there's about a year lag. Um, so we are to help meet the requirement of the legal and financial vulnerability assessment. We are talking with OneCare about um, ways to get more timely documentation of risk analysis and assessment. Um, we'll actually talk about that a little bit later when we um, talk about their budget material. So this is, is an overlap with the budget review. Um, in addition, the Green Mountain Care Board reviews board of manager meeting materials um, where some of these items are discussed. Um, you can go to slide 10. So in the provider network section, um, again, here are the documents that we review. Um, we annually collect a network development strategy. Um, this also overlaps with the budget recommendation, something that you're going to hear about new um, in, in the budget review this year is we are moving a lot of these. Uh, well, let me back up. Because we've been doing this now for several years, uh, we find that there's reporting that we want to collect um, year over year. Um, and instead of having all of those um, items, um, you know, necessarily spelled out in the budget order, uh, we're working towards a, to develop an ACO um, reporting manual that captures those items. So this is an example of one thing that will be in the ACO reporting manual, um, the network development strategy. Um, we'll continue to collect that. Um, in addition, another thing you're going to hear about in the budget um, is we are working on a curated provider network list with the Green Mountain Care Board analytics team. This takes the provider list that OneCare submits to us year over year from 2018 up until now, um, allows us to merge it into one file so that we can um, 
perform more analytics on that data and understand the, how the network is changing um, over time. Um, so we're really excited about that project. You'll hear a little bit more about it, um, but this, this falls under certification as well as budget. Um, and the, the recommendation here or the monitoring here is um, just to establish a um, relationship with um, One Care analytics folks who can help our analytics team um, work on this list and answer questions. Under population health management and care coordination, um, there are some policies that are up for review in quarter four. Um, we'll also continue to require more robust monitoring and evaluation plan for community specific population health investments. For example, innovation fund and specialty pilots. Again, this shows up um, in that in the budget as well. Uh, you can go to slide 11. And again, always tell me if I'm not talking to the right slide because um, my other screen still hasn't caught up. Um, on slide 11 here, we have performance evaluation and improvement section 5.207. Um, again, we collected the same documentation that we have in the past, quality imp improvement procedure and utilization management plan, clinical priorities and quality improvement plan. We'll continue to um, review and collect those. Under patient protections and support, section 5.208, we collect semi-annual complaint and grievance information, um, and we review public comments submitted to the board, and we collect feedback through the board's um, advisory committees, um, as well as the things in the ongoing monitoring and reporting. We also, I'll mention, um, do keep in um, close contact with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, who also collects um, you know, inquiry or, or um, calls that come into their um, hotline on this issue. I 12, we're at the provider payment section 5.209. Uh, again, there's a whole slew of policies here that we collect and review. Um, these change over time um, and or, or sometimes new ones um, are added. We um, collect those um, and, and make sure we have the most up-to-date set of policies. Um, and there are several that are up for review in quarter four. We can update the board on those as they come in. Under the health information technology section, um, again, a number of policies that we continue to um, review and monitor. Um, we are um, also interested um, in gathering, you know, as these um, platforms and applications and the use of the systems have evolved, we're interested in um, hearing from users and we may um, be interested in in repeating a demonstration of um, the, these technology platforms um, as we did the first year that we reviewed certification in 2018. You can go to slide 13. This is uh, some criteria. Um, the first two which were added and um, don't show up specifically in the rule, but they're in statute. Um, and so these are also criteria that have been included in certification since um, since the original certification was done. And these were these were reviewed, and again we continue to review them um, annually. Um, and there was they submitted um, updated information on these um, programs, and um, we will continue to review that. Some of these items go into the reporting manual. For example, under the pay parity um, requirement, um, we have been looking closely at the comprehensive payment reform program um, that has been in place for several years now. They were, uh, the, the ACO reports to us twice a year on results in that program to help us understand um, how um, those payments are being made to independent primary care practices. Uh, I think you can go to slide 14. <clears throat> so slide 14, again, this is your reviewing the items that OneCare will submit um, to help us to continue to monitor certification as we um, move forward. So OneCare is to submit any updated and relevant plans, policies, procedures, agreements, contracts, um, subcommittee charters, governing documents, um, you know, items that um, we monitor as 
as we go along in the year. Um, these will come through the reporting manual um, quarterly, semi-annually, or annually as determined necessary um, in collaboration with OneCare. Financial statements are submitted quarterly. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about um, the format that we want those submitted in. Uh, executive team resumes, we started collecting those, I think, last year. So when there's an executive team change uh, or somebody new comes on, we collect those. Um, legal and financial vulnerability assessment. Again, we're working with One Care on how best to meet this need um, through audit or other um, financial reporting. Network development strategy comes in annually. Uh, population health and care coordination evaluation plan comes in annually. Complaint and grievance reporting semi-annually and reporting on these areas of mental health access pay parity, addressing childhood adversity reporting come in either annually or semi-annually. So the next steps um, for certification is to hear any um, board questions, follow up or discussion um, on, on the certification, um, any public comment. Uh, I will note that the certification uh, works process works a little bit different than the budget. It does not require a vote to continue certification. Like I said, the ACO remains certified unless the board takes action otherwise. Um, Mike, you can correct me if I um, misstate any of this, but um, the, what, what we will do is publish a memo of these findings as we have in previous years. So if there are, if there's certification questions or discussion, um, they can come up in the meeting. Um, again, we will collect public comment as well that the board can review. Um, and so with that, I don't know, we didn't um, ask Chair Mullen if you wanted to do questions on this now or hold all questions to the end. Um, I think we'll hold them all to the end. Okay, great. Then that completes um, my overview of the certification section. Um, you can go to slide 15. And I will transition us to the uh, mm -hmm. FY21 budget review. And oh, my slides caught up, so that's great. Um, slide 16 is the next one. <clears throat> okay, so in approving an ACO's budget, uh, we're shifting now to the budget. In approving the ACO's budget, um, the board will consider um, these criteria in the rule. So any benchmarks established under 5.402 of this rule, the 16 criteria that are listed in 18 BSA 9382 B1, that's um, budget specifically, um, as well as any elements applicable to the all payer model agreements. The board also must consider the public hearing, um, which was held on October 28th with um, one care as well as comments received in writing from the public um, or verbally. Um, we're gonna review those in, in just a minute um, and questions or comments by the healthcare advocates. And I also wanna uh, note that the full criteria are provided at the end of the slide deck as resource slides. Um, and you know, by way of example, some of the criteria includes um, working with um, to prevent duplication of services, how the ACO is integrating with the blueprint for health, um, also how they are investing in primary care and community-based services, addressing social determinants of health and adverse childhood experiences. Um, the board also needs to consider how the ACO is supporting improved population health outcomes, rewarding healthy lifestyle, Choices. So I'll, I'll make a note here that the criteria is quite broad um, and wide reaching, um, giving, giving that the board, or sorry, it gives the board broad authority to oversee the budget. While on the flip side, the lack of specificity in the criteria um, of the levers that you have to pull does present a challenge in homing in on the right conditions to ensure that the criteria are met, which is why we have so many slides year over year um, to, to get there. Um, in addition, many of these criteria relate to the strategy underlying the all pair model, um, as I mentioned, which we'll discuss toward the end of the presentation as it relates to the administration's recent, recent uh, all pair model implementation improvement plan. I'm going to pass it over um, briefly to my colleague, Sarah, who is going to um, say something about the public comment that we've received. Are you, are you good to go, Sarah? Can you hear me? Yes. 
Excellent. Um, so this is Sarah Tewksbury, Health Policy Analyst with the board. Um, I just wanted to go over this slide briefly. Uh, here we have a summary slide of all the public comments that the Green Mountain Care Board has received as of yesterday, which was December 8th. So far, we've received 13 comments on the ACO's FY21 budget submission. And then in that left column, you can see the list of organizations and individuals who have submitted their comments. In the column on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see a summary of some of the common themes that were generally seen throughout. Um, and just to briefly go over those, uh, there was a general increased uh, appetite for transparency with the public and with regulators. Uh, public comment is also, there was reaction from the public commenters in care navigation platforms, data analytics, and the support for the providers in the network. And there was a desire to see those things continue. Uh, folks also commented on a uh, desire for concentrating on expanding healthcare access for all Vermonters, um, ensuring that that is something that continues to be at the forefront of both regulators and one care's mind. Folks were overall, they were pleased with the population health initiatives, but would like to see an increase in funding to further these programs to see what else we can do um, to help Vermonters. Uh, general you know, desire to see a continuation of value-based care, and then uh, a lot of comments talked about considering COVID-19 and the uh, global pandemic that we see ourselves in now. Um, what does that disruption mean for the evaluation of the all-payer model and one care's performance? And how are we going to take that into consideration as a group? Um, so that was really the raw comment. And as mentioned before, we are still obviously taking public comment until the 21st of December. And you can find all of these 13 public comments we have received already on our website. So I'm going to pass the to Elena um, to start taking you through a review. review. Okay. So the um, we we separated this into categories similar to last year. Um, so we'll go through the ACO budget at a high level. Talk about the budget components, the provider network, payer programs. Um, and then what this means for our all-payer model scale. And then we will talk about population health, and the model of care, uh, one care's risk model, administrative expenses, uh, budgeted total cost of care and trend rates, quality, uh, and then regulatory integration. So I'm, to begin, I think, you know, we tried, we were thinking about how best to kind of roll forward and build on prior year. Um, so there are a number of recommendations, not all of them referenced here, but you know many of the recommendations from prior year we expect to roll forward. One um, kind of new way of thinking about this is to think about what is really reporting and, and to simplify the budget order and to allow us um, time to really um, be more precise in our language and expectations in, in the reporting uh, requirements is to move a lot of these items into a reporting manual. Um, and so we will work over the next couple of weeks to kind of um, propose what that, sketch that out, what that could look like. Um, but our first recommendation would be to, um, you know, simplify the budget order, ease administrative burden, op operational efficiency, and, and move some of these um, standard reporting um, that can live in a, in a more tangible um, uh, document that lives year over year. Um, in addition, we have a couple new recommendations that um, we will talk about as we go for go through this presentation. So the summary components, um, I think year over year, we have seen quite a bit of growth. Um, in 2018, it was around 634 million. Now in 2021, proposing a 1.4, uh, you know, almost $5 million billion dollar budget. Um, this is similar to the original budget um, proposed in 2020, but as we all know, um, there were some reductions there associated with COVID. Um, and um, and so we continue to see attributed live uh, lives grow, um, you know, not at the rate that we had hoped or that are specified in the targets in in the all payer model contract, uh, which we know are to be ambitious, but there is still room to grow here. Uh, so just to to make note why you may see differences here, the 2018 and 19 attributed lives are are based on. Um, actual lives, um, including attrition, uh, whereas the 20 and 21 estimates are really about um, scale. 
So that is the January 1 um, attributed lives um, estimate. And we see that, as you know, as I mentioned, we continue to see this revenue growth. Um, you know, the 20 budget is, is relatively flat relative to the 21 budget. Um, sorry, the 21 budget is relatively flat as compared to the initial 20 budget um, with a dip in, in the June 16th um, proposed revised budget um, by one year. So, you know, I think the majority of um, revenues flowing through one care are, are you know, I shouldn't say flowing through one care. Are they accountable for um, in this view of the budget? About 96% is really for provider reimbursement. So that may or may not flow through one care. Um, what does flow through one care is payer program support, um, including blueprint funding, uh, state support, participation fees in the in the hospital dues, um, and then other grants and deferred revenue. So this is in some the dollars that um, one care is accountable for, in addition to um, dollars um, required to operate um, these programs. On the expense side, um, you know, this we should see a, for each revenue um, an offsetting expense um, as they try to hit a zero dollar budget year over year. Um, in their, they propose a zero dollar budget year over year um, in net income, um, but we see kind of a similar around 95, 96 percent uh, goes to provider reimbursement, um, where it's about one. Uh, just over 1% for admin expense um, and population health is um, just over 2%. So, you know, I think we need to think about these in two separate chunks in terms of the accountability dollars, but then what does it take to operate one care? And that's really the bottom two rows, the one care admin expense and the population health or payment reform um, investments are also in there. So breaking down the components um, further, um, I think we heard from board members that we'd like to see it in a uh, per member per year um, amount. So I think there are, we have to recognize um, in the bottom three line items that these are, um, there are a lot of things happening here. You know, we have changes in population. So I, you know, we have to be careful how we interpret these values, but this is um, at a very crude level, uh, provider reimbursement, admin and population health divided by um, scale over time. So it shows direction um, and kind of another way of looking at relative investments over time or relative costs over time. Um, but we need to be wary about how we would use these um, metrics. So we included it here as a reference point um, for your ease. Now I'll turn it over into the provider network. Um, I believe, uh, Sarah, are you talking about this one? Yes, I am. Um, so Sarah Dukesbury again. Um, I worked on the provider network and payer program slides this year. Uh, so I'm going to start here with this slide, uh, 26. This slide is here highlighted the changes to the One Care Provider Network from 2020 to 2021. Um, as you can see, there were not major major changes to the network in the past year. Um, and in fact, One Care's network development strategy actually focuses on retainment retainment and maintenance of the current network and how to better support the provider network rather than um, increasing the network. Um, so at the bottom, you can see that the network expanded by um, Rutland Regional Medical Center and Community Health Center for the Rutland region joining the Medicare program and that there are four new entrants into the comprehensive payment reform program. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so slide 27. Um, this slide highlights something really exciting uh, that we're in Green Mountain Care Board provider network data that OneCare has reported to us since 2018. We're going to touch a little bit on this during the certification review, uh, but just to reiterate what's happening here, um, one of our amazing data analytics teammates, Lindsay Kill, has been working to create a curated network list with all the data we've collected since 2018. This network list is definitely a work in progress, um, but it's going to help the Green Mountain Care Board better understand the data we are receiving from OneCare in a year-over-year -year capacity. This is also a really great opportunity for OneCare to uh, and the Green Mountain Care Board to better streamline our data collection. Um, and I'm really excited about that uh, because in the past, the Green Mountain Care Board has not collected the same standardized data points since 2018. So we're going to work with OneCare in the future um, and 
make sure that we backfill this data um, and verify it with OneCare so that we're able to use it in a better way going forward. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so all this goes to say that our staff, staff recommendations for the provider network will include an enhanced collaboration with OneCare to better standardize templates for data collection. Um, and the recommendation is literally that um, cross-team collaboration at the Green Mountain Care Board in partnership with OneCare will produce a standardized template for data collection, which will then be incorporated into the ACO reporting manual. Um, we also have a carryover recommendation from last year that has a minor change, um, uh, which is that we are asking OneCare to supply us once again with their network development strategy. And the minor change is that when we receive it this coming year, it will be incorporated into the ACO reporting manual. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we move on to the payer programs. And this slide here is just a reminder and a disclaimer that the analyses for the payer programs um, done by the Green Mountain Care Board and the next couple of slides, they are based solely off of one payer's budget submission since the payer contracts are still under negotiation. So please take that in con into consideration as we review the information on the next few slides. Okay, so I'm on slide 30 for those of you on the phone. Um, and the purpose of this slide is to show the payer programs that are contracted with OneCare. Uh, and basically this table walks through the attributes of the payer programs. So you can see uh, going across the top, we've got Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, QHP, primary, and then MVP. It obviously walks through the quality measures that are aligned with the all payer model, payment mechanism, risk, and age of program. Uh, please note that the Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP primary and MVP risk columns uh, all say contracted because that information is proprietary um, and we will not be discussing that. Um, you'll see in the note at the bottom for all that for all payer programs, the services included in financial targets are aligned. And this statement I've just made is based solely off of One Care Vermont's submission to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, because these contracts are still in negotiation. It's also worth noting uh, attribution methodology. Uh, Medicare's attribution is claims-based, while Medicaid is claims-based and includes the expanded cohort. Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP, primary and MVP's attribution methodologies are all proprietary. Um, on slide 31. Okay, and then this is a great transition slide uh, and I'm about to hand it back the baton over to Michelle Degree so that she can walk you through uh, scale. But this slide basically gives an overview of how payer programs apply as a scale target initiative under the all payer model. Um, these following four requirements must be met in order for programs to qualify. Um, so that's sort of a transition right into handing it over to Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be just a, a pretty quick overview of um, what was discussed with you all at last week's board meeting, but for folks who might not have been there, I did want to uh, provide a quick update. So again, scale performance um, with OneCare as our only ACO. Um, this is sort of where we're at uh, currently, and we can show here all the way through projected 2021. Um, again, that same disclaimer that I made last week um, that um, the estimates here for 2020 and 2021 are based on 2019 population. And so those will change. Um, as an example of that, and in light of full transparency, uh, we did notice a mistake that we had made on some of our um, federal reporting where we accidentally updated 2018 using the 2019 uh, population estimates. And so um, we have gone back and corrected those errors. Uh, but uh, just to, to make sure that folks are clear, so the all pair scale target for performance year one, 2018, the final was a 22%. Um, and then uh, for 2019, we have a 30%. Uh, 2020, again, still waiting for the 2020 population estimates, but best guess right now is 42% and a projected 46% for 2021. Uh, the Medicare scale target, again, 35%, 47%, 44%, and 
6% for projected 2021. Um, again, as I mentioned last week, you know, we are well aware that there is a scale target response uh, being put together between the Agency of Human Services and the Green Mountain Care Board at signatories on the model. Um, and uh, we likely won't see the impact of some of these proposed changes until that performance year five timeframe. Um, but so to keep that in mind as we, you know, we are making progress, although not at the level that um, is required uh, in the agreement as Elena stated, but stay tuned. Uh, you can move to the next slide, Elena. This is just another way to look at it. I know folks like the, the graph here, so just another way to look and sort of see where we're, where we're missing. Uh, so this is all payer scale. And if you move to the next slide, Medicare scale. Uh, again, the population estimates will be updated as soon as we're able. Um, and I think that's actually it for me. What I will add here is that as has been mentioned in um, several previous uh, comments, uh, we will include again, I think the um, requirement for the ACO to report um, their attribution numbers to us will be moved into that standard reporting manual. Um, so that's uh, a recommendation that won't necessarily be called out as it follows over from previous years, but will be moved into that broader reporting manual. Um, I believe with that, I turn it over to Marissa. Hi, thanks, Michelle. So we're, we're on slide 36. I'm going to transition over to the ACO population health and model of care section. Uh, you can switch to slide 37 if you haven't already. Um, this graphic on slide 37 should be familiar to you all. Uh, it depicts OneCare's model of care and core activities or programs within the model. OneCare's care model is based on a four quadrant risk stratification algorithm that divides the population into healthy well, early onset stable chronic conditions, full onset chronic illness and rising risk, and complex or high cost acute catastrophic. The care model provides a framework for decision making and resource allocation in the budget. So that's um, why I present it here. Uh, slide 38, please. Um, on this slide, uh, it's meant to boil down the seven criteria that are most applicable to review of the ACO's model of care and population health program. So those criteria are cited there at the bottom. Um, in the left box, um, you'll see that the criteria requires board members to review and consider these three buckets. So um, there are incentives and resources, and, and that's the language um, right from the criteria. You could also think of that as um, payment changes. Um, two is uh, information that they provide or, or data. And three is um, efforts, or I think of this as support or, or tools that they provide. Um, and then on the right, the criteria call out these priorities specifically, um, and that is to strengthen primary care, to integrate with community-based providers in the Blueprint for Health, um, also specifically um, talks about mental health and substance use disorder, as well as addressing social determinants of health and the impact of adverse childhood events and effects on appropriate utilization. Next slide, 38. Um, and again, these, these two slides, 38 and 39, are to help you um, build a sort of a framework for thinking about um, and evaluating the, the population health budget. So um, to on slide 39 here, to review the care model and population health programs in the budget, we looked at how one cares narrative, testimony, and reporting um, fits into this criteria. So I'm gonna call these bullet points here that you see, you could think of them as core competencies of the care model. These are bullet points as identified by OneCare in their narrative. And I sort of put them under these buckets. So in the payment changes bucket, um, we have value-based payment design and distribution, financial support through program investments. Under actionable data, we have the four quadrant risk stratification model, uh, practice and HSA level population health analytics, and evaluation of process outcomes and return on investment. In the tools for care redesign uh, bucket, we have um, you know, that one care uh, and the ACO is meant to be a leader and facilitator of delivery system coordination, as well as care management and care coordination support, and they provide IT applications for clinical care. 
Um, these include like Care Navigator, the provider portals, various applications for training um, and, and support of the provider network. Uh, slide 40, please. So on slide 40, um, these are noted changes and things to keep an eye on um, as we're looking at the, um, at the budget. So um, I'm gonna go through some of these highlighted, highlighted changes. So the blueprint self-management contract, um, which is in the primary prevention line item. Um, this is a contract that's transferring to one care starting January, 2021. Um, focuses on diabetes and hypertension management. The change was a result of stakeholder engagement, focus groups, literature review, um, in partnership with the health department. Um, and OneCare will use strategies to better identify the population that can benefit from these programs, including wraparound support from RISE Vermont, patient prioritization application in um, Workbench One, which is their data analytics platform. Um, and then there's um, ramping up of the Vermont Health Learn online platform, um, particularly um, in light of the need for online platforms during the uh, pandemic. Complex care coordination. Um, <clears throat> so uh, OneCare implemented a new schedule of payments in July of 2020. This was delayed um, from April due to COVID. Again, a lot of this you've heard about when OneCare came in to present their revised budget and their discussion of how they had to um, revise these programs and investments um, in light of the um, public health emergency. So I'm not gonna go into that um, in, in great detail. Um, so we asked OneCare um, for explanations for some of the changes or variances in these programs. So under complex care coordination, there's a a notable um, decrease of 25% um, in funding toward this program. Um, and they describe this as um, refinements that are being made to the program in 2021. It is still an evolving program. Uh, One Care is working to focus efforts on high risk subpopulations, um, inclu including um, you know, those that have an impact on high ED utilization and inpatient readmissions. They're developing and refining graduation protocols to focus on who can best benefit from this program. Uh, they also talked about right sizing of the care team and how to modify around COVID when you can't have um, care conferences in person. Um, I will also note in this bucket um, that um, they are, you know, working on. Um, Increased engagement, developing a robust set of metrics. Um, there's there was discussion about increasing skills training um, for care coordinators um, and um, evaluating um, return on investment in this program. Longitudinal care program is the next uh, item there. One care discussed how they're expanding this program um, from Burlington to six additional HSAs. Uh, according to the narrative and testimony, this program shows results and promise. Um, they state in their narrative a savings of um, over 1,100 PMPM uh, per member per month in reduction in inpatient admissions and ED utilization. Um, the longitudinal care program is. Um, also in the same, uh, sorry, is in the same um, line item or bucket um, as complex care coordination. This program is uh, funded or currently funded through delivery system reform dollars um, and OneCare will provide plans for the 2021 program if funding is appropriate by the state and contracted with OneCare. So that is uh, still in uncertainty. Value-based incentive fund is my final item there. Um, and so this has been changed um, to uh, have a more immediate distribution of funds throughout the performance year. They're moving the quality accountability to settlement and um, tightening the set of measures to inform the VBIF incentive. Um, we will need to defer to final contracts here and we'll need more quantification on what this change means because um, you see there's a, a quite a dip in this line item. So you're gonna see that reflected in our recommendation. And so you can flip to the next slide, number 41. 
this is a detail of the expense line items for population health management and payment reform investments. Um, so I, I'll go through them briefly. Uh, the top line, the top one there, basic one care Vermont PMPM. This is growing with partic increased participation. Um, complex care coordination, we talked about the dip there in the previous slide, um, as well as the, v the change in VBIF. Um, primary prevention, this includes uh, RISE Vermont program and the addition of the Blueprint self-management programs. So that's our understanding of the change there. Um, the specialist line item includes carry forward money um, for the, um, well, there, the chronic kidney disease program was funded through this and then the mental health program um, as well. Um, and the the dip there, um, one cares note is, um, you know, there's, there's no new programming here. The foundation and the focus, um, again, has been on primary care. Um, so there's not additional funding in this bucket in the 2021 budget. Innovation fund, also no new initiatives, but this fund does include, um, you know, several um, programs, uh, New Americans Clinic, Ocular Telehealth and Primary Care, Telecare Connections, um, Wellness Plus, Community Paramedic Pilot, Dash Mental Health Pilot. Again, um, you know, these programs, um, as we need more information about it, about them, um, we should defer to explanations from One Care. Um, the Blueprint for Health, um, which includes in this uh, table, is the PCMH payments, community health teams payments, and SASH added together. Um, I'm going to talk about that. I think it's on the next slide, but um, one more item here. Uh, primary care engagement uh, is based on engagement with individuals who have not seen a primary care provider in the defined look back period. So I think uh, with that, you can go to slide 42, which is sort of a summary um, of some of our analysis and, and takeaways here. So um, the blueprint, my bullet points down there, um, the blueprint dollars have been level funded from 20 to 21 um, for historical um, purposes here. Uh, there was about a 3% increase from 18 to 19, 4.7 from 19 to 20, and this is based on an, an inflationary factor. Um, and so this is um, uh, the budgeted numbers here are, are different than they've been in the past. Um, also, historically, we have looked at uh, population health management ratio. So that's the um, population health investments to the um, revenue. We've looked at this in two different ways, um, excluding the blueprint dollars. That's the second to last line there. Um, and that is because that is a um, defined bucket. So it doesn't necessarily signify additional investments. So we've looked at the revenue that way. We've also looked at the total population health investments over revenue. Um, but either way you um, slice it, we've you know seen over time that that um, ratio is decreasing. And we talked about this last year as well. Um, the, the reason it's decreasing, of course, is a function that the total revenue is going to grow um, much faster based on um, new participation and attribution. It's going to grow much faster than those population health programs can be scaled up. Um, appropriately. So there's there's really no benchmark for the right ratio here. Um, we've seen how it's sort of played out over several years. Um, the programs don't scale up as, at the same rate as attribution. So we have continued to use this as a metric, um, though last year there was not a recommendation to hold it to a certain level. And this year there's not a recommendation to hold that ratio to a certain level, but we, are, we continue to kind of look and see um, where where it goes because theoretically if scale gets to a steady state um, then you know that could start to go um, up again but um, it's just something to keep an eye on um, as well I will um, uh, actually let's see um, oh and another um, note about population health investments is um, the these funds um, are, are one way of sort of redistributing money um, in the system, you know, coming from hospital dues and then going out to providers or coming in from contracts going out to providers. So, um, uh, you know, that's why we, we of course, want to see how um, that increases over time. You can go to the next slide, which is 43. This is just another cut um, of the population health um, 
investment over time, just a little bit more visual. Um, the things that I'll sort of point out here is that the top bar, um, the dark blue, and sorry, it's very small on my screen, but that is the, um, the, you know, the payment reform, the PMPM. So again, those are growing um, as they should be. That, that um, section is getting bigger because as there's more um, participation, then that's going to get larger. Um, the second one from the top, um, the sort of lighter blue, that's the blueprint. And again, that's held, um, you know, generally steady plus the inflationary factor, um, which is not included in this year's budget. And then the third box that you can sort of see there, um, excuse me, is the care coordination bucket, which um, which does have some you know, significant variance, which we've talked about and, and one care talked about as well um, in their narrative and hearing. And then the next one that you can sort of barely see, um, the gray is the value-based incentive fund um, decrease from 19 to 20, um, which also one care talked about in their responses and their um, uh, narrative explaining that. So all of this uh, is gonna bring me to slide 44, um, which is where our recommendations are at this point. So um, I will say that, um, you know, staff has some concerns over the growth um, of these investments over time. Uh, we recognize that it's a balancing act. Um, you know, the money has to come from somewhere. So the hospital dues um, have, you know, were decreased um, due to COVID, trying to give some release to hospitals there. Um, and so it's um, a matter of both, um, you know, finding funding for these programs and um, having to um, balance out the, the the needs of, um, or you know, recognizing the difficult situation with hospitals, and again, this is sort of an area of, of overlap with hospital budget review. Um, also, of course, programs are evolving, and so um, as they evolve, they may take, um, you know, more admin to to implement, um, and or can't be, you know, can't um, be scaled up as we might like them to be, because um, we want it to be not just throw money at something, but have it be done well. So um, I'll, to, oh, okay, so to go back to the recommendations here, um, again, we've already talked about um, the top one there, the shifting reporting requirements for ACO reporting manual. Again, this is um, a thread that you're seeing throughout. So some of the standard reporting is listed there. Um, the second bullet point, um, if population health management programs are not fully funded as detailed in the 2021 budget submission, uh, one care must submit a revised proposal in the spring, um, and this should include request for budget revisions, um, explanation of the changes, um, any funding shortfalls, changes in program scope, um, analysis for each program line item, talking about you know what can be scaled um, up by attribution or other factors. This was in the budget order last year. Um, Number three, uh, the our recommendation there is that One Care must fund the SASH and Blueprint for Health um, in the 8.4 million um, plus an inflationary factor. Um, and just for by way of um, some background there, um, going back to the original um, vote in 2016, um, where that included initial 7.5, sorry, initial 7.5 million dollars. Um, for this program in, in performance year one, the vote justification, um, you know, does does specifically say that this was intended to be trended forward annually um, to fund Vermont's proven primary care and prevention programs, um, including the blueprint for health and support and services at home. Um, and so um, this has been uh, somewhat foundational to the, the model, at least from the board's perspective. And finally, there, um, one care, um, and again, it should be a little tweak here because I do believe we, we do have the value based incentive fund policy, um, but we're also looking for one care to quantify the proportion of the VBIF that is now operationalized at settlement versus distributed throughout the performance year, explaining and quantifying any and all mechanisms um, that tie financial incentives to quality performance. So we just need to have a better, get a better idea of the dollars that are tied to. Um, value because the um, line item that we have isn't quite descriptive enough of that um, as our understanding and the explanation from one care. So um, that brings me to the end of the population health recommendations and section.
And I believe I turn it over now to back to Elena to talk about the risk model. Yes. Okay. Um, so the risk model. Thank you, Marissa. Um, so just some background, you know, as a reminder, uh, One Care Vermont assumes risk from the payers uh, to provide care for or the, for the accountability of care for a particular population as specified in the payer contract. Um, the contracts with the payers do not specify how shared savings or losses earned under those contracts should be distributed. Um, rather, One Care designs and implements the methodology for establishing total cost of care targets for participating providers and any methods for distributing shared savings or losses. Um, these are documented in One Care policy. Um, you know, I think we've had some of those policies to date that um, you know talk about um, the process through which they um, kind of finalize those distributions. Um, and I understand that because of the change in the risk model, some of those policies are still under development, um, namely the performance incentive pool. So we'll look forward to receiving um, those updated policies and bringing that on before the board. Um, you know, this is a, a snapshot of what um, the estimated risk distribution looks like this year. Um, this is in thousands and there's approximately 19 um, million dollars um, at risk. So this is off of the top of the total um, cost of care. Um, and this is about 52% um, held at the, um, by the network, um, UVM network. Um, and I think the rest is, um, you can see kind of, there's some variance in how it's um, distributed and, and um, we'll talk about what that um, might mean later. Um, so, you know, just to understand uh, what the change is, um, I think we can go back to some basics. So who is the primary holder of risk? In the 19 or what we're calling the HSA model, the hospitals were the primary holders of risk. This is, again, um, a, a design choice by the ACL. In 2021, um, hospitals continue to be the primary holders of risk, but risk is now expanded to primary care as well. Um, the methodology for establishing total cost of care targets and distribution um, under the HSA model is really based on HSA expected and actual performance in a particular payer program. Um, in the 2021 model, it's really about network expected um, or an actual performance in a particular payer program still um, with this 10% shared savings incentive pool if shared savings are achieved. So, you know, we still need some details there to understand how that works. Um, um, and then, you know, I think there is one thing that to consider here um, is, you know, the HSA level model was very complex and often unclear, um, kind of the mechanics and, and you know, how, what, what can be expected um, over time um, from the provider perspective. And the network model does appear to be much simpler, uh, but I think we're still waiting on some information there to confirm that as well. Um, you know, so in in some, it this shifting from the HSA to the network model um, proposes to increase collaborate collaboration across the network. Um, hospitals may have more incentives to look outside of their HSA for a most efficient care setting. Uh, there's increased motivation for the ACO to identify and lead strategic planning for system wide cost control, which I think is a good thing. Um, you know, however, it remains to be seen or you know, or justified whether these incentives are strong enough uh, for individual providers to motivate these collaborative behaviors. Um, you know, some, some thoughts here is, you know, there's still a tension uh, between the placement into the most efficient care setting and kind of hospital incentives for revenue growth as they, you know, if they're still on a primarily fee-for-service basis. Um, so these marginal decisions may still come into play. Um, the fewer lives an HSA um, has, um, attributed, the less richly they will be rewarded for their engagement. Um, so that may not motivate behavior in the same way that some HSAs who have more lives uh, may have. Um, and then, you know, it's again, it's not clear what the local performance incentive um, is or how it works and if it's sufficient, but, um, you know, we look forward to those details. And then there may be, I think it's just important to note variation and efficacy of incentives um, in either direction, it's again unclear, but whether or not a hospital owns primary care. So um, I think it's it's important to kind of note that we, you know, it may have been complicated before, but we we don't really know or have a clear sense of, um, you know, 
exactly what's happening here, but also whether or not the, there's a, a, a link between the incentives and kind of the desired outcome. So we're looking for more information there. Um, so while we agree that simplifying the risk model and evolving it to foster collaboration is, is a good one, it's unclear from the budget submission at this stage how the risk model's underlying methodologies accomplish this objective. Um, so we'd like to condition, or we're recommending to condition the approval of One Care's budget on the submission of some additional detail um, that allows us to understand the underlying risk model methodologies distribution, including mechanics of the 10% performance pool, um, any market factor adjustments that may be applied um, at distribution or prior to distribution, and any other potential adjustments that are kind of on the table um, that providers should be aware of before signing up for a program. Um, and, you know, I think about if timing wise, we can figure out what makes sense, but I think at the very least we need, once we get the final contracts and attribution, we should have this information before us. Um, so if the information submitted by one care is deemed insufficient by the board, we know written is probably appropriate first step, then I think we can invite them again to come discuss um, the risk model before the board. Um, so we can really understand the logic behind some of the shifting incentive structures. Um, okay, so now fixed perspective payments. Uh, uh, this is just kind of a, uh, an update on prior year. I think these are estimated and my apologies for not including them previous years. Um, we'll try to update that in the next version. This was kind of a last minute addition. Uh, but, you know, I think we, we are about 33.6% of One Care's um, accountable um, payments or accountable lives um, are in a fixed perspective payment. Um, this is about 1% increase over prior year. Um, and this is measured as a percentage of total cost of care. I think, you know, while this is an interesting statistic, um, and we can see how it varies across hospitals, you can see that it's not really a huge percentage of provider income at this point. You know, it ranges from zero to, you know, 22% or 23%. Um, so while, you know, they do have kind of a foot in the door, it's really not, we're not there yet, right? So I think, you know, we should think about whether or not it makes sense. You know, I think this was um, another stream of, of uh, discussion in HS's recent um, all payer model um, improvement plan, uh, but something that we've certainly been thinking about at the board is, you know, should we set our fixed perspective targets? Um, what should they be at the state? How do we think about setting targets for payers, perhaps, or, um, you know, the ACO? What should we think about would be a goal for provider budgets, percentage of provider budgets? So, you know, this is the ACO budget process, so I won't spend much time here, but I think there is, you know, it's not just up to the ACO, we have to have all parties engaged. Um, but I think it is something that we should continue talking about if we are um, serious about making the shift to value-based care and increasing um, fixed perspective payments uh, for providers to, to really facilitate delivery system transformation. Um, so with that, we'll move into the administrative expenses. Okay, so here's a snapshot of administrative expenses over time. Um, you can kind of see um, salaries and benefits continue to be kind of the major um, component of One Care's admin expenses. Software is relatively stable over the last couple of years. Contract services um, dropped, um, and then you know some of the other stuff uh, we kind of occupancy and supplies are interestingly increasing despite um, shifting to remote work. But we did see risk protection kind of drop, so that was I think. Um, a product of um, uh, the method of, of protecting risk in the Medicare program. Um, you know, so salaries and benefits, the, there's an 18% increase over the 2020 revised budget. Uh, it's about $1.5 million, so it's not insignificant. Uh, part of this is due to compensation restoration due to COVID, but we'll go into more detail on some of the drivers of those salaries and benefit increases. Um, software, like I said, is about flat. Contracting um, did decrease. Um, they did look for savings for just essential contracts. Um, in the other line item, there is um, there was a note that the GMC billback would increase 100 
160,000, but that is an overstatement. I understand uh, there really should be flat over prior years, so that should come out of the budget. Um, and then occupancy and supply costs, as I mentioned, their lease expense um, was proposed to increase by $111,000 um, this spring. Um, and then supplies continue to increase. So, yeah, I think this is just a little bit different of a trend than, than we would have expected with the shift to remote working and, um, you know, kind of trends we're seeing across the, the state, at least. Um, so if we're going to talk about salaries and benefits, um, and there, we asked for some more information here to better understand it. And I think, you know, this is a start, but there's some questions still out there about how best to think about salaries and benefits in these kinds of human capital investments. Um, however, so to start, the net impact of vacancy reinstatements um, is about $500,000. A reinstatement of leadership compensation, that was a temporary um, reduction during when COVID started. You know, COVID's still ongoing, but another thing. Um, it was about $600,000. And then there was a net cost of living increase um, for $209,000, and then there's $170,000 that um, we didn't hear an explanation for, but that amounts to about uh, $1.5 million. Um, so, as I mentioned, you know, what are the right benchmarks for these human capital investments? How should we think about them um, for an ACO, kind of their impact on the broader health system? What kind of return should we expect from this level of investment? So, I don't think it's very clear. It's very hard to find appropriate benchmarks um, in this space. And, you know, ACOs are still relatively new, so there's not a huge amount of um, comparative data, but I think it's worth kind of pushing to think about how we can get some um, deeper insights here. You know, I think One Care's organizational chart is very helpful um, as a starting place, but it doesn't allow us to link um, kind of their strategy to their human capital investments or their FTEs. So I think you know, the recommendation here um, is for Greenmount Care Board staff to work with One Care to establish standard reporting of human capital investments as it relates to One Care's core competencies and overall strategy. Um, and these could be, you know, I categorize a number of ways we could think about how FTEs are involved or support a particular population health or payment reform program, what are the nature of these roles, um, and then who's, you know, supporting One Care's more kind of, you know, operations, so leadership, finance, legal. Um, so, you know, we're open to thinking about what this could look like to be most useful, but I think that we could benefit from some more fine grained information here to link the budget to strategy more tightly. Uh, retained earnings. Um, so this is a new kind of topic for this year. Um, so I think we kind of asked the question during their One Cares budget hearing about gap-based financials, and, and I'll kind of provide some background and more insight here. Um, but in 2018 and 2019, this is a quote from One Care's recent response. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board budget orders required One Care to build and maintain reserves. And as a result of this order, One Care developed a budget that would increase hospital dues to supply cash that helped satisfy this budget requirement. Uh, prior to closing out any fiscal year, One Care engages with its governance bodies to evaluate the expected net income and consider options such as credits and dues um, paying providers. Um, and you know deferrals in accordance with GAP. So, you know, we did ask for One Care to increase their reserves. Um, you know, and and we'll, I think in two thousand sorry in 2019 it was about 3.9 million dollars. Um, in 2020 we asked them to hold this reserve, um, and in 2021 I think we can talk about what makes sense here. But some other information um, that we just received last week um, was. You know, kind of the accumulation of these reserves are actually over and above the requirement that the board set forth. Um, so in 2018, there was about a million dollars um, uh, of surplus, so that got moved to net assets. In 2019, it was about 4.7 million. Um, in 2020, they're projecting zero um, net income. Um, and so I think we need to talk about, you know, this puts us at a 5.6 or puts one care with $5.6 million of surplus as of December 31st, 2019. Um, this would be more than sufficient to cover the 3.9 million that was required in their budget order in 2019 and leaves $1.7 million of undesignated surplus by the end of the year. Um, in 2020, like I said, you know, this made sense because they were, they were funding the risk for three network hospitals um, in 2020, they continued to fund that risk mitigation, but moved the 
risk mitigation to the founders. Um, in 2021, the risk mitigation is contract contracted to less than a million, um, but is expected to be held by OneCare. Um, you know, last year we did allow them to maintain the reserve to, to allow for general liquidity. Um, and I think that still makes sense, but I think we, we should be, um, we should have a conversation about what the right level of reserves are, given that this is pulling money um, out of the system and that we don't want this to just accumulate in perpetuity. Um, so I think it, there needs to be some kind of conversation about what the right level um, of reserves should be um, and, and some transparency about why that makes sense. Um, you know, so I think there are kind of two kind of things to, to note to keep in mind. You know, 2019 surplus was unaccounted for in the 2020 budget process. We didn't have this information. Um, we don't get gap-based budgets. So the budget we get is an accountability-based budget. So that's going to be something we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but there's also uncertainty around the impact of 2020 net income, which is currently projected at $0. So I think understanding of whether or not they really expect to come in at a surplus or a loss would be helpful. Um, you know, it's very rare that organizations tend to come in right on zero dollars and it's actually very hard to do. Um, so, you know, if there is um, a surplus or loss, that should certainly be factored into the decision. So the recommendation um, as it relates to OneCare's retained earnings um, is for OneCare to propose a plan for disbursement of undesignated reserves or to justify maintaining a particular amount of reserves um, above the existing reserve requirement. Um, I don't think this is something that we think we can come up with on our own, but One Care should help us understand what the right level of reserves are um, for the system um, without over-reserving. And then One Care should report the updated final 2020 net income um, and its subsequent use to the board at year end. And then this leads us to the gap-based or um, submitting a budget that's in alignment with gap um, principles. Uh, this would allow us to understand the cost of operating One Care expectations for the coming year, allow us to understand the internal flow, key performance indicators and operations at OneCare, um, the levers that may be used by the board to adjust OneCare's budget. Um, you know, we're not going to affect health services directly, but what, what the board actually does affect is OneCare's admin budget and the dollars for which they are um, responsible. Um, and then how do submitted actuals compare to audited financial statements? This is something that we don't have a way of tying out um, in its current state. So um, we we will, we've received the audited financials. There's really no way to make sense of them as they relate to the budget for accountability is what we're terming the current way that we collect um, one cares budgets. And then as mentioned in the previous slides, um, the use of profits or losses at year end and, and what happens to those, whether they're applied to hospital dues reinvested in population health, or they are maintained in a reserve for a number of reasons. Um, you know, that is something that um, this would allow us to track and understand on a um, more granular level. So as, you know, as it relates to these gap-based submissions, I think we can talk about what the right timeline is, but we would want to um, work with OneCare to crosswalk submitted actuals per budget submissions through the audited financial statements for fiscal years 2018 through 2021. And then beginning in 2022, as part of our ACO budget guidance, we would ask that OneCare submit its budget for accountability, so the, current, the version we currently get, um, you know, uh, with a view that allows us to understand the aspects of that budget that aligns with US GAAP. So we can talk about operationally whether this makes sense to do two separate budgets or whether there's a way we can submit one budget and make these kind of clear connections. Um, in terms of the administrative expense ratio, this is how we've thought about admin expense over time, um, is to look at relative to the total revenue um, of the ACO, um, which would include reimbursements for healthcare spending. Um, if you look at um, the admin ratio and the population health ratio, which is how we've thought about these kinds of trajectories of expenditures over time, you'll see that the admin ratio is decreasing at a rate faster than the population health ratio. And that's, you know, while we do want to see a reduction in the admin ratio over time, the, you know, the relative rate is, is a little bit troubling, but I don't think we really have a great grasp on whether or not, you know, there are FTEs in the admin budget that really could be or should be categorized as um, indirect support of particular programs. So I think 
that we can do some additional work there to provide some clarity, but until we have that level of clarity, it's really hard to interpret these ratios. So just to kind of summarize some of the uncertainties related to the admin budget that we've talked about to date, you know, this relative rate um, of reduction um, in the population health and the admin ratio um, is hard to interpret. The number and nature of new positions at one care, the amount of $500,000 is unclear. The unexplained salary variance um, of 170, the overstatement of the GMCB bill back in the amount of 160, increasing occupancy and supply costs despite the shift to remote work. Um, and then I believe DSR funding is uncertain um, in general. So that's another piece to note. So in light of you know, these uncertainties and the financial challenges facing Vermonters, um, you know, and cost saving measures implored by businesses, schools, state and local government. Um, you know, we should really think about what the right level of um, administrative budget should be this year. Um, and so we recommend um, level funding the 2021 admin budget to 2019 actual. So this is about 15.4 million, so approximately $700,000 um, reduction compared to their um, proposed budget, which is 16.1 million. Um, and then we would ask that this comes with a commensurate reduction to hospital dues or a reallocation to population health. And so, you know, I think a theme that comes forward is thinking about kind of what does this buy us as um, we started a number of years ago, there was a budget order condition um, that uh, that requires over the duration of the altered model agreement for one care's administrative expenses to be less than the healthcare savings, including an estimate of cost avoidance, the value of improved health and projected um, to be generated through this model. Uh, so we just wanted to provide a, a quick update um, that you know our analytics team is working on this and they've kind of boiled it down to two um, key projects. So changes in provider outcomes. So does one care change provider outcomes? And then what is the return on investment of one care's population health investment? So um, I won't spend much time here because I think we could go into great detail, but it might be something that we, um, you know, our analytics team can kind of provide an update to us on a, um, in the future, on a future date. Um, and then just to mention, and as Susan mentioned at the beginning, you know, there we have a number of um, upcoming board meetings, and one of them will be to discuss um, the Medicare benchmark. And I think as part of that discussion, we can get more into budgeted trend rates and the total cost of care. Um, but just wanted to state that, you know, setting financial targets um, during the pandemic is particularly challenging. Um, and while we don't anticipate any issues meeting the financial targets in the agreement, it's something um, that we'll look into, you know, when we discuss next week. So, you know, I don't think there are any concerns here, but there is a lot of uncertainty. So um, it is kind of uh, hard to get clarity as the, you know, the situation is constantly evolving. Okay, and I'll turn it over to Michelle um, to talk about quality. Uh, thanks, Elena. So uh, just wrapping up on the requirements uh, as it relates to one care and the agreement, health care model agreement. Um, so here we just have a quick overview of the quality performance again. Um, the the payers presented to the board back early in October on this uh, information. So Lena, if you want to go to the next slide. Now we're on the slide. This would be 73. It's unmarked. So I just wanted to um, kind of provide again the crosswalk. So the crosswalk that you're seeing here is specific to 2020. Um, again, since we don't have final payer contracts for 2021, um, I can't update this until that time, um, but just give you sort of a, a heads up of where we are starting to see that, that good overlap in measurement. Um, all the bolded measures here, which don't really look bold on the screen anymore, um, are ones that uh, are the same across all payer contracts. I will say that you'll note that the CAP, or the Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, is theoretically across uh, all payers. However, uh, Medicare just released the final rule for 2020 performance measurement and the CAPS requirement was removed. Um, and so we are currently working with our federal partners to see how that will impact all payer model um, reporting requirements and performance. Elena, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So looking ahead, uh, the payer contracts or the crosswalk, as I just said, will be updated to reflect 2021 when we have those contracts in hand. Um, some reporting considerations, again, as I just noted, 2020, um, 
uh, Medicare, the CMS final rule removed the CAPS requirement. In addition, 2020 Medicare uh, will likely revert to paper reporting only, um, and that is just due to their ability or inability at this time to do the quality measure validation audit that typically takes place at the federal level. Um, I apologize for my dog in the background. Uh, upcoming quality and reporting work. Uh, we have, again, the ACO versus non-ACO provider analysis, sort of looking at that um, across the, the state system. Um, analysis on stayers and quality results over time. So stayers being those who uh, were attributed to the ACO in 2018 and continue to be attributed and looking at their health outcomes over time um, or their quality results over time. And then again, and finally, the ACO impact on all payer measures outside of payer contracts. So, um, you know, there are broader population health goals uh, at play in the all payer model agreement. And so looking and doing a deeper dive to see if um, the ACO has an impact on any of those things as well. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'll just state again that uh, this will not be a formal recommendation from the staff, but will be moved into that reporting manual that you heard Marissa talk about, um, just making sure that we have uh, updated information from the ACO um, when it's available, and that will go into that reporting manual. Elena, you can go to the next slide. And that's it for me. I think this is back in my court. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up here, but before we do, um, we're going to talk about regulatory integration with a particular emphasis on ACO oversight and the all pair model. Um, uh, so just to, I mean, I think the theme has been mentioned a number of times, but to be explicit, um, you know, staff have been working on ways to identify opportunities to drive all pair model results through ACO oversight. Um, one of the key pieces of work that we hope to kind of um, evolve over the next year or so is to identify and incorporate concepts of ACO core competencies and key performance indicators into the ACO oversight process um, to start this work or to continue this work rather. We um, hope that One Care Vermont um, could submit their strategic plan um, to the Green Mountain Care Board and this would be an important um, input to that work um, as we consider kind of what the um, key core competencies are that we should care about as a state. Um, and then uh, certainly another intersection is um, HS's recent um, all pair model implementation improvement plan. Uh, so staff analyzed recommendations and identified intersections with ongoing and future work. Um, and so that's what we're going to uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, you know, and so we, I just want to be clear, you know, some of these had um, Green Mountain Care Board um, as a responsible party. And then some of them, while we are not of the, the actor um, in the activity, I think that we can still learn and inform our processes from the outcomes of some of those um, activities. Okay, sorry. So number two, reduce the Medicare risk corridor. Um, you know, I think this reduced risk corridor is reflected in the ACO's budget um, proposed for 2021. Um, so that's hopeful. And then number five, uh, recommendation number five, um, from AHS, ensure the Medicare benchmark provides as much stability and predictability as possible. Um, you'll hear more about that next week, but I believe that that work is already underway. Um, and then number seven, um, AHS and the agency of administration expect to conduct education and outreach to non-participating self-funded groups. Um, we applaud these efforts um, and the extent to that the ACO is involved in these efforts, we um, would hope to learn about any outcomes in their scale strategy. Um, you know, we did ask them to present a one pager on the benefits of self-funded programs and um, they've submitted that last year. Um, in, um, I think as it relates to more um, kind of refining of um, our reporting mechanisms um, in the reporting manual, there are two items, number eight and nine, um, as it relates to kind of establishing clear milestones for fixed respective payments um, in contract model design and also understanding how the ACO um, or how ACO participants um, move incrementally towards value-based incentives, the providers they employ. So understanding how value-based incentives trickle down um, to the uh, kind of point of care. Um, and, you know, I think if we can understand um, the ACO's value-based 
payment strategy in more detail, um, you know, in kind of in a cohesive fashion, we can really kind of move the needle there. Um, so how is the ACO working with payers and providers to increase value-based fixed payments across the system? And then, you know, asking them to identify clear milestones and goals for contract design um, with their, in conjunction with payers. Um, the next activity um, annually in its budget presentation, the Greenmount Care Board, to the Greenmount Care Board, One Care Vermont should identify cost growth drivers um, across the network and how they expect to curb spending and improve quality. So I think you know, this aligns with many of the fundamental questions that are inherent in the reporting requirements that we already um, have in the ACO budget guidance, but I think there are certainly opportunities to refine and clarify those requirements. Um, and I think the 2022 ACO budget guidance is a, is a great opportunity to kind of move that to the next um, next step. Um, and then in conjunction with the ACO reporting manual that we hope to be more of a standard kind of mechanism for um, reporting, reporting templates and understanding what kind of data we hope to look at over time. Um, recommendation or activity number 12. Um, you know, partner with One Care Vermont to deliver system users, um, I'm sorry, and delivery system users to evaluate the efficacy of Care Navigator. I believe this is an AHS activity. Um, you know, we would just hope to understand the outcomes of this coordinated effort, um, and we would also enjoy, you know, um, receiving a demo of the tool so that we can kind of understand on a more um, experiential level, kind of um, to um, how this, um, how these tools are working and how we can kind of um, understand their implementation on a broader level. Um, relatedly, uh, there's another uh, activity around um, understanding the value of the data that OneCare provides to its network participants, um, data and insights. And so I think, um, you know, similarly, we would hope to understand um, from one care any efforts related to evaluations um, and we would also you know uh, um, welcome a staff opportunity to kind of get our hands on the data and analytics and kind of experience what providers are experienced um, uh, and then i think this kind of echoes um, a comment made by uh, board member holmes on um, october 28th during one cares budget hearing on kind of surveying uh, you know and soliciting uh, provider feedback um, on the provider experience with tools and data. And then finally, um, we understand that there is some work to be done to kind of understand roles and responsibilities between um, HS, One Care, and community providers. Um, and so I think, you know, to the extent that this unfolds, it would be very helpful to our work and um, some of our, you know, some of the specific policies, um, One Care's policies. Um, to understand kind of where those conversations lead um, as we kind of look forward to our future budget policies. So we'll conclude with next steps. Um, you know, today we hope to have a robust board discussion of some of the recommendations that staff presented. Um, and then hear what else you may need uh, from us or from One Care before, you know, as the next few weeks kind of unfold and you prepare to consider a vote on this budget. Um, as we mentioned before, public comment is accepted through December 21st um, in order for staff to consider those public comments in their final round of recommendations. Um, and then we'll conduct any follow-up if needed um, from today's discussion with a potential board vote scheduled on the 23rd at the same time as the Medicare benchmark um, potential vote. And I believe one date that's missing here is the presentation on the benchmark, Medicare benchmark on the 16th. Um, that was mentioned by Susan earlier. Uh, we also um, will post the Medicaid advisory rate case um, and the contract once it becomes publicly available. As noted numerous times, those are those contracts are still under negotiation. And then, you know, at some point when this is all wrapped up, we will produce the 2021 budget order, update our monitoring plan, um, finalize the reporting manual, um, and then, you know, the I shouldn't say the last item, but you know we should re always remember that you know this isn't really final um, at any point, but certainly without final finalizing payer contracts and final attribution, which is presented to the board in the spring. I have some resource slides there if you'd like, but otherwise I will pause and Chair Mullen turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Elena, and thank you everyone for the uh, presentation. Um, 
before I open it up to uh, board questions to begin with, I was wondering maybe um, if Robin might be able to um, give us a history of the support and services at home and blueprint funding and why it was a win-win for the state at the inception of this agreement. And uh, I, I think that there's different uh, opinions of um, what this really is. And, and Robin, maybe you could help bring some historical perspective to it. Is that something you could do, Robin? Sure, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, thanks, Kevin. So when the the context at the time that we were negotiating the original all payer model agreement was that Medicare was sunsetting uh, their medical home uh, demonstration projects, which is, was the source of the blueprint SASH and community health team, the blueprint PCMH and community health team and SASH funding um, prior to the all pair model. So uh, it was a priority in the negotiations to secure um, some way to continue funding those programs moving forward, in part because both the Blueprint and SASH had positive um, federal evaluations, which demonstrated Medicare savings for participants uh, in those programs. So uh, it made sense knowing that uh, these were successful programs in terms of curbing total cost of care to want to try and maintain those. Um, the mechanism that we were able to negotiate with the federal government was to include that in the all pair model agreement. And because that is an ACO based model, uh, the funding mechanism became part of the Medicare uh, benchmark conversation, including with that appendix into the agreement, which allowed for um, pre funding, if you will, recognizing that uh, those monthly payments that go out to providers uh, that that those needed to continue up front. Um, so, and as part of that, we were able to negotiate that those that those program funding could be trended at the same level as the rest of the Medicare program, uh, ACO program. Um, and it's it's worth probably noting that prior to the agreement. Um, those funds were not trended. However, they were paid on a PM PM basis. So, um, so there's like pros and cons there. In the current way that it's funded, the the trend also kind of allows for additional growth in people participating in, from Medicare, because otherwise it would be a flat amount more people as we reach scale, which would reduce the PM PM. Um, so that's. That's really the context that we were looking at as we moved uh, into the agreement and why that was an important component of the negotiation. If there's anything else that or questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you, Robin. I think that was very helpful. I'm going to open it up now for questions from the board, and I guess I'll go in reverse alphabetical order today. So starting with Maureen. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thanks for your presentation. It was uh, a lot of material to go through and a lot of recommendations. Um, I guess there's a few things that you know I, I'd like to talk about. One is, as far as the recommendations on page 69, I believe it was, which was to level fund their admin costs. Um, I'd like to talk about that a little bit and partially because I think the 15.4 million that you're talking about, which is what will be achieved in 2020, to me is really a COVID year. Their budget was 19.3 million. Their original budget in 20 was 19.3 million for admin costs. And um, the 15.4 obviously we're achieving because they couldn't support a lot of the programs um, and, and they weren't hiring and they cut back salaries and things like that. So it's not that I don't want them to reduce their spending. Um, I just think to, to put in a number that really was for a COVID year when what their actual budget is for 21 
um, is significantly lower than what they had requested for 20 for their 20 budget. I, I'll just clarify there, Maureen. I'm sorry if I misspoke. The the level fund would be to 2019 levels. Right. So the COVID. So that 2019 was pre-COVID. Um, so that was a 15.4. Their COVID budget is well below that 14.4. Okay. So I, I just, yeah. Yeah. And their 21, their 20 budget that we had approved was 19.3. So that was the original budget we approved pre kind of uh, them coming back and the reduced budget, I think was really impacted because of COVID. So you're right, you're, we're level funding to 2019. But my concern is that, you know, we're in a growth mode now and we still only have a third of the population you know, behind the ACO. Um, and so the costs for the admin and the population health, both of those are, are very small compared to the, the total expenses that we have because the bulk of the expenses are for, um, obviously for the payments from Medicare, Ma Medicaid and commercial. And I think you all know I'm, I'm the one always pushing cost savings, <laughs> not, you know, not increases, but, you know, I think here too, where their board of managers really has, you know, a bit of an oversight over their spending. You know, when I look at kind of the discretionary areas, there really are two, it's kind of the admin costs and the population health. And clearly we saw the population health numbers come down and I would like those to be higher. Um, both of those, the next dollar in, if you will, has to come from the hospitals for their participation fees. And those are reduced quite a bit from what they had been, you know, in 2019. But that to me is also the, the way that their board of managers works with many of them from the hospitals. You know, I, I think that is a good check and balance system there, you know, that they're challenging, is this the right administrative structure and things like that. And I just don't think it's the time to try to cut that back when, you know, a lot of their admin costs are the care coordinators and the people helping support the programs. So I, I understand totally, you know, that we want to look at things and have costs reduce. And I think there's time and place for that. But I'm not sure that right now uh, the time is really to be pressing there. You know, obviously that's one one board member's point of view. So as as everyone else goes through, I'd kind of like to hear hear where they are. You know, on that. Um, you know, looking at some of the other financial pieces. Um, you know, clearly they've they've changed uh, some of the way they're looking at the risk model um, and how that will be administered this year. Um, I, I do think it's important to try to get the pieces of the risk out to, you know, all the people that are participating. So not just the hospitals and having the providers in there as well. So I think trying to move that way, um, you know, could be a, a better way to look at it. Um, you know, I am also concerned that, you know, since they're now going to be looking at it more globally than rather at the HSA, that some of the smaller participants, they're not going to be able to move the needle one way or the other. And so not to say they won't be working hard to to make this work, but if they're only, you know, 5% or, you know, under 10, 5% of the risk reserve piece, you know, if they are, if they, if they are favorable, it's not going to put too much into the pot. And if they're unfavorable, it's not going to drive the pot too much. And so you just worry are the incentives, you know, to really get those cost of care down going to be there. But again, I think that's where some of the board of managers and the oversight can, can look at that. Um, you know, similarly with the reserves, you know, we they've built the reserves up over the past couple of years. They're not putting a reserve, an additional reserve in this year. I don't think they need to put an additional reserve. You know, when we look at um, how much risk is out there and with half of it lying with the network, you know, there's not a lot of additional risk there. Um, but as well, if if there's additional use of that reserves, it may be through population health, which they need to come and get approval to, to use those reserves, or ultimately it may fund back again to the hospitals for their 
um, participation fees. So, you know, I think we're going to have to let's let's see what happens with the risk model and the reserves. Um, you know, when you talked about the gap reconciliation, you know, I, I think we should get the gap reconciliation um, at some point. I, I, you know, I think we just need to get that bridge for, you know, what are the reports that we have now, and how does that look on the on the gap piece? Because, um, you know, they should be able to do that, but many times you do work with budgets that are not the gap budget. Uh, you know as we're looking at so I, I don't think that that's unusual and you know different things that come into play or when reserves are booked and you know a reserve may be booked in one year that comes back the next year and it, it really the intent of that reserve was the year before i think accruals i'm not talking the reserve piece so people understand but you know accruals that type of reserves um we change that um you, you know i i just think that um we're just still so early in this process and that, you know, we need to get, if we want to get this to succeed, um, you know, I, I do give the ACO um, some room to be putting forward what they think is the best things that are gonna, gonna, gonna work there. So I, I think what you guys have set up and, you know, the recommendations and the oversight, um, I think that will all be helpful for the process. And really the only one that, you know, I would look to talk about changing would be the level funding, you know, really for what, you know, I've described and I just think we need to be really clear about, you know, what, again, what they had put in for this year's budget and how much that we've grown from 1919, 2019 to 21, right? So the, the dollars have grown a lot, the participants have grown and to cut that back at this point, you know, that, that may be a challenge. Um, so that's all I have, thanks. So I would just follow up on that, Maureen, that I viewed it differently than um, level funding, because if they're at 14.4 million, you're giving them the ability to go to 15.4 million, you're talking about a 7% increase. And I, I get very much that the 14.4 is cut from um, where it was in the budget because of what happened with COVID. But I would also worry about a, a rapid uh, growth spurt in uh, admin dollars and so I, I looked at that a little bit differently than than you did, and you may be right. And I look forward I to getting feedback from uh, Right, it's nineteen point three that they had originally budgeted, and I think we need to understand at least how much of the reduction to the fourteen point four um, were because because of COVID, where they couldn't really reach out and run some of the programs that that needed need to be run because they because you needed to be in person and things like that. So, you know, that, that's where I would question that, but. The, the other question I have for you, Maureen, is you commented about um, not having any um, monies going to reserves. I, I'm not so sure that I would be calling it going to reserves, but uh, retained earnings. And it almost looked like there was 1.7 million. And if they've already built up uh, enough dollars to, um, really meet the goals of what we had originally hoped for um, to mitigate risk. I'm curious if you had mentioned that it might be for population health measures. Well, if it's for population health measures, why didn't they just budget those population health measures as part of their expenses? Yeah, I think that's a good question for them. Yep. Okay, Tom. <clears throat> Thank you, Ken. Uh... Can you hear me? Because I, you guys have been breaking up a little bit over here, but so am I coming coming through to you? You're coming through loud and clear. And, uh, All right. Nobody I'm was breaking gonna... up in here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave my video off just to kind of keep the strain on the system uh, as as little as possible. Um, my first, I, I only I have three or four areas that I just more want to emphasize than discuss. Um, the first has to do with um, slide 52, which is a slide that um, profiles the um, percentage of fixed prospect of payments and across the system, uh, it's, uh, it shows that in total it's 14 and a half percent of uh, ho hospital budgets. And I just, um, 
I, I feel a little bit like we're flying without a clear target in mind in the future. Um, we're four years into the all pair model, and I can't tell you um, where we should be um, FFP as a per percent of, say, revenues or expenditures of the hospitals. Um, the whole concept is to have a mild capitation program, which is fixed prospective payments, and to use that to encourage efficiencies and, uh, um, and, and savings and investments in population health, et cetera. But um, as I look back at the 2019 numbers, hospital FPP was at 10.2%. In the 2020 budget, it was 14.5%. And now it looks like it's projected uh, again for 2021 at 14.5%. And so I, I would like to maybe ask the ACO, tell us where we need to be in order to get the kinds of leveraging and efficiencies that are, are anticipated as part of one of the fundamental structures of the all-payer model, which is transitioning from fee-for-service to fixed prospective payments. Is it so for our, the major providers, hospitals, which are 50% of the, the spend pie, is it 30%? Is it 45%? You know, where, where, what is the number that we should have as a guiding star that when we go through budget review for hospitals and we go rate review for the insurance companies yeah. that we are trying to manage toward that target, that we are uh, explicitly aware of a target, um, we understand what its underpinning is um, and, uh, uh, and work toward it. So um, I, I, I I, I would be supportive of uh, a provision to ask the ACO to recommend to us, not to establish it, but you know, to have a conversation with us, a formal conversation with us as to what that that target should be. Um, also consistent with that, I just wonder what is the capacity of the ACO should fixed prospect payments become a bigger piece of of their activity. Um, you know, if, if if, if the target is 30% um, or whatever the target is, is the ACO, um, I mean, we, we've done a, a good job, I think, of getting the ACO up and running. It now um, functions and it has a, a couple of years under its belt. It's still new, but what is, where would it need to be in order to be able to reasonably and economically and efficiently manage, you know, a doubling of, of FPP or could they do it with existing resources? So that's that's um, one of the areas. <clears throat> the uh, uh, the next one would be having to do with the model for care and the top two quadrants in that um, chart that is presented. I think on page 37, but it's one we've all seen many times, um, which uh, you know, talk about uh, or, or or profiles 84% of Vermonters as being a uh, in a, a low or medium risk. Uh, quadrant. And I'm just um, would like here again to have the ACO uh, recommend to 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 look to look at at their um, metrics for population health and uh, communicate with DIVA um, as to re um, evaluating the benchmark plan. It just seems to me that um, you know, that that the QHP population is a large portion of the ACO's uh, um, <clears throat> uh, coverage, uh, 70 or 80,000 Vermonters, and that benchmark plan under plan un underscores their relationship, but I don't believe um, it is well aligned uh, with the population health metrics that we're trying to achieve. And so um, I, I think it would be valuable for the ACO and the people that that they represent and for the board, but to have a conversation with DIVA about reopening that benchmark plan and restructuring it so it's better aligned with population health going into 2022. Obviously the 2021 period is, is, is just too close in hand, but to start the process going so that um, this time next year, you know, we can all be certain that the benchmark plan uh, is is well aligned with the healthcare reforms that, that we are trying to achieve. My third area 
with the um, uh, related to slide 56. Um, and on that slide, what is profiled is of the of the amount of risk um, in play, how that is distributed over um, the different hospitals. And for example, uh, UVM uh, is looking at 34.8% of it. Um, and and uh, as another um, uh, uh, kind of point, uh, uh, Northwestern is 8.6% of it. But uh, then when you look at that amount of risk relative to the revenues of each of those hospitals, it's less than one half of 1% for UVM Medical Center, and it's 1.5% basically for um, Northwestern. So I'm just, you know, I, I'm just, I, I, I the, the risk is relative to uh, their revenues. What kind of revenues are they putting at risk um, in, in their risk corridor? And I, I think looking at it in terms of uh, a percentage of the revenues is helpful um, and informative. And I um, can um, uh, kind of expose and, and have this part of the discussion, you know, the impacts of the payer mix and the cost shift. UVM Medical Center is much more able to uh, cover to um, cover their risk than I think Northwestern is just given the payer mix and cost shift, but that's kind of buried in 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 this system. So um, uh, that that's a concern of mine. Um, <clears throat> and the fourth area is in terms of of rearranging the risk. I'm not going to spend the, the, the kind of you know, approach to risk. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I worry that moving to a system-wide uh, um, approach with a 10% um, uh, kind of kicker there for areas that might be doing well is, is something, and, and I know the staff has asked for this, so I, I'm just emphasizing something they've asked for, is, is we need to better understand that. Why is 10% the number, A? Um, what happens if um, the UVM medical network sneezes to all, in that system? Do all the other hospitals you know, then get a cold because, because the medical center is more than 60% of all uh, revenues across the 14 hospitals in Vermont? So um, I understand maybe the need to kind of find some uh, consolidations and efficiencies um, in how risk gets allocated, but I worry that uh, that we go to a system where the good efforts, uh, independent efforts of Southern Vermont or Northeastern or uh, North Country hospitals kind of get lost in the fray and uh, they live or breathe with how the network hospitals are doing in terms of um, uh, savings and uh, um, and shared savings and, and, and earnings. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm just reinforcing what the staff is saying. We don't know enough there. I, I, I don't know where the 10% number comes from. I, I don't know what it means. And I'd also would like to hear from the hospitals about what they would think about that, um, uh, you know, is, is whether they would rather you know, pull their fate with UVM network or um, re remain relatively independent. Um, other than that, uh, those are the areas. I think the staff did a great job of laying out all the issues. It's incredibly complex. And uh, I know from talking to you, <laughs> you know, there's probably been some hair pulling from time to time, but I, I really appreciate your effort and uh, and uh, the conversation that we're having, and I think we'll end up in a good place. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, Robin? Thank you. Um, I'd like, um, I'm glad you guys are uh, put in the recommendation for uh, having the team get a demo of the tools. I think that uh, when we did that the first year, that was really helpful for staff and a lot of our staff on, on this team has turned over. So most of you haven't had that opportunity. Um, and I think having you have that experience will kind of bring it to light, which will be helpful. So I do like that um, part of the uh, certification recommendations. Um, it, to Maureen's point, I am concerned about the decline in the population health 
management spending. Um, I, I do think it makes sense to ensure that we're targeting the care coordination program appropriately so that um, we are efficiently using those dollars. So uh, maybe, and certainly the areas that um, Marissa mentioned around ED utilization and uh, I believe it was readmissions makes sense. I don't feel like I got a very good complete sense of how those, what those subpopulations are other than those two that Marissa mentioned. Um, so I think I could be made more comfortable if I had a more granular sense of that. Um, so if that's something that the ACO wants to provide, that would be helpful to me. Um, on, um, on slide 30, obviously we can't, because of the confidential proprietary information, it's difficult to talk about the risk components in the uh, private, mm -hmm. in the commercial payers. Um, I, when I went back through my materials, um, I did have a couple questions about that. And so I'm wondering if we are and this, I guess, is really more for you, Kevin. I'm wondering if we're thinking about potentially having the ACO come back in um, sometime in the next couple of weeks before we vote to, to kind of address some of the issues that we're raising. And if so, that might be an area that I would be interested in exploring in a little more granularity with them, which probably requires, and not probably, it would require an executive session. So I'll just put that out there. I would leave it to them whether or not they wanted to answer uh, um, this presentation in writing, or if they wanted to um, have an, a you know uh, a virtual meeting. And um, at that point, Robin, I think you'd have to be prepared to go into executive session. Yeah. So um, that's yeah, and it's a little bit hard to talk about now because I can't really pose my questions. <laughs> without us going into executive session. So maybe I can just pass that on to staff. Okay. Um, I, I, the questions, just so that the public has an understanding, that relate to um, ensuring that we are strengthening alignment across the payer programs um, around uh, the items that are outlined on slide 30, uh, particularly around risk. Um, in terms of the admin budget, uh, I think Maureen, you made some good points around um, we want to make sure that as we're growing attribution that we're not underfunding some of the supports that we feel like are needed um, at the ACO level. And um, to that point, I liked the part of the recommendation that tries to work through how do we take the admin budget and understand how much of it is really uh, population health support. So in the last, I don't remember if it, which meeting it was, but I mentioned how the blueprint has these different components, including one which is essentially technical support to the provider level. And I think some of the admin personnel at the ACO may function in that level in that way. Um, and I think there is an analogy one could make to the medical loss ratio calculation that's used with insurance companies, which carves out um, care management resources from the admin percentage. So I think trying to figure that out would give us a better sense when we're looking at the admin budget, what's supporting uh, the programmatic components versus uh, what I would personally consider as true admin. Um, I guess I want to hear more from um, if the ACO chooses about their admin budget justifying uh, the increase because it's hard for me based on what we have to sort out how much of that increase supports the core programming versus um, other stuff. Um, so I haven't really, I guess, made up my mind on that yet because I hear both sides of it. Um, and I do think, you know, we have identified 160,000 in terms of the bill back, which was uh, not accurate. So we know of the 700,000, the staff recommended cutting 100.
60 at least is immediate right there. But um, obviously we're not gonna get into that level of line item cutting, we don't do that. I would leave that to them, but having a better sense of that would be helpful at least for me in making up my mind. Um, and um, as I said at, our, at the budget hearing, um, I am in favor of trending for the blueprint dollars. Um, I think especially when you're looking at attribution and an increase of about 9,000 Medicare uh, attributees that if you level fund, you're really doing a cut to the PCMH program, which would be um, funded the same amount, but delivering services to 9,000 more people. Um, I think those were my comments. Great. Thank you very much, Robin. Jess. Great. Um, well, thank you. And thank you to the staff. I know how many hours you put in on this very, very thorough review. Appreciate it greatly. Um, I guess I'm going to echo some comments I've already heard, so I'll try and be a little bit briefer. Um, it's the beauty of going second to last. Um, so around, I, you know, it, was, it is discouraging to see some of the reduction in care management dollars, population health investments, um, in particular care management dollars. And I just want to note that some of the budgeted amounts rely on yet to be determined funding from DSR. And so to me, it's also going to be important to understand um, some of those care management, you know, funds may actually be less than even in the budget if DSR funding doesn't come all the way through. So what are the consequences for delivery reform um, and total cost of care effects that might happen if, this, if these dollars don't come through? But also, uh, is there a commensurate reduction in administrative costs if those programs um, are, are not able to be funded? So, uh, you know, how do we link each of those programs to the support that may be required to administer them if the funding doesn't come through. So hopefully it does, but um, I'm just recognizing that some of this funding hasn't been actually allocated yet. Uh, I share Tom's concern around the discouraging, you know, sort of the look at the, the proportion of payments that are fixed payments. Um, obviously delivery system reform is not going to happen until we have payment model changes. So it would be helpful to, to hear from the ACO, uh, maybe this is a recommendation that we've had, I can't remember all these recommendations, but what is the strategy to begin? I think that is a recommendation in there, but I think it's really important one. What is the strategy and what are the milestones that we can expect to see to get more uh, payment in fixed, perfect, fixed perspective payment? I think it's just really important to be thinking about that. Um, I also share others' concerns around the risk model. Um, I do agree. I like the idea that the risk is going to be spread beyond just the hospitals. I think that's important to other providers, but I'm not convinced yet that this model necessarily incents the shift to the most efficient care setting, particularly given the fact that there's such a low proportion of dollars in fixed prospective payment. So Actually, I would think that providers would have greater incentive to shift care to more efficient settings if their risk is tied to their local performance, not necessarily the total network's performance. I worry about a free rider problem, particularly you know, if there's an HSA that has low attribution. How much is that going to incent um, behavioral change, delivery system reform? So I think I would need more information from the ACO, um, understanding how this risk model works. Maybe I'm just not fully understanding the justification or how it's going to better incent delivery system changes that we want to see. How are we going to know it's working? The model suggests that there'll be more collaboration. Will there be a measurement of that? Do we, how are we going to know if this new risk model works better than the old one? What's the measure of that? Um, so those are kind of some big bucket thoughts. I, I think for the most part, the um, recommendations I agree with. The admin costs, I'm, I'm listening to Robin, I'm listening to Maureen. Um, I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation that we all have to think about. Um, I, I do think at the end of the day, we probably just don't have enough information right now. You know, there was, it sounds like there was an overstatement of bill back. Uh, it sounds like there are some, un, un, it's unclear what some of the salary increases are for new growth there. If they're population health supports, if they're for care management, that's one thing. If they're for other administrative overhead, maybe that's a different story. I think just more information may be helpful um, in understanding the growth in admin, particularly when we're seeing population health programs and investments declining. Um, it's just an important understanding there. And I, I guess I would say to, to Maureen's point, I think the uh, 
yes, there was a reduction in admin overhead because of COVID. We're still in COVID. And actually COVID is, is actually worse probably now than it was maybe back in June when they adjusted downwards. So for me, it would also be helpful to understand what's the COVID impact on the programming um, that's anticipated, you know, that relates to admin. Um, if the reduction was because of COVID, it seems to me we're, COVID is not much better now. It's in fact worse. So how does that all, you know, um, come together? And just a last question, and this is probably just a small clarifying question, but um, the CPR funding on slide 41 went from 1.3 million down to 1.2 million. Um, but on slide 26, it was talking about four practices added to CPR. So I, I'd, I'd have to go back to my notes and remember how that all works. But if somebody has a quick answer to that, how the total funding for CPR could fall despite the fact that four practices were added. Um, yeah. That might be helpful. Um, yeah, so you're looking on slide 41, um, the yeah. comprehensive payment reform line item from 20 to 21. Yeah. It, it goes yeah. up from 1.1. 1. 1, well, it's it's not a reduction. It's a slight increase. What was it in two, 2019? I, I guess now I don't have it up in front of me now. Can we just uh, go to it from 2019? 1.3. Okay, and now it's 1.2. Oh, I see. I see from there. Yeah. So if we're um, left in 2019 to 2021, I guess I'm just, and maybe it's because there was a drop in 2020 of number of practices and they bumped back up and on. So I guess help me understand that. You can yeah, do that I offline. Have to double check. But I think they paid out less than they expected um, from, from in uh, 20. Um, but that could be COVID, right? But yeah, we can get some more clarity. It wouldn't be COVID. It wouldn't be COVID because of the fixed payments. I guess I'm, you know, I, when you would you would think that if you're adding four practices, you would see a growth in um, that line item. At least I would. That was my thought there. So it's just from confusing. pre, yeah, from pre-COVID. I understand. Yeah. But but that's it for me. I appreciate all the hard work, though. Thank you. So I guess for me, you know, pretty much everything has been said, but. I'm still struggling with the fact that we're this many years in and we still don't have a handle on things as it's reported. Um, you know, when you have a discussion about uh, holding admin costs flat, that's really about true admin costs. I'm not so sure that in my mind, um, a discussion on population health or community care initiative should really be um, put in the same um, area as admin costs. And, and for me, I'm talking about holding the administrative costs of the organization itself in check, not trying to put in place a check on uh, anything that would have benefits. But then once you get to that statement about anything that would have benefits, I mean, I go back to what I said, I think, a couple of years ago when I was referring to the um, project that RRMC did with reducing readmissions by changing the way the cardio practices were conducting business. And you could target what your savings were. And yet here we are in 2020, and we still can't say that um, this population health initiative saved X amount of dollars um, because of because this program was put in place. And, and that's what's kind of troubling to me that, you know, we, we've worked towards a dashboard, but I still worry that we're not getting the feedback quick enough on where the successes are and where the successes are, maybe where you really need to put that additional money in that was talked about. Um, because if it's working well in one area, it might be able to be replicated and work well in another area of the state. So I, I just, uh, it's more frustration than anything else. And that frustration carries forward to not being able to explain certain things. Like I've heard today, we've, ex we, we believe that the 160,000 in the uh, budget for additional bill back was in there inadvertently, but I still don't know that for a fact. Um, we don't know if they just misbudgeted last year 
and that's from that. I assume that since we haven't heard anything from them, that that was not the case. But every time I make an assumption, I really worry about that. Um, and I still get back to um, when you're talking about this type of an organization, if you don't have the purpose of days cash on hand or reserves for a specific risk mitigation, why isn't that money just allocated in an expense line for population health initiatives that would be able to demonstrate returns in quality, access, and cost containment? And so I, I guess I'm just frustrated with the whole process because it doesn't seem to get to where I hoped it would be, um, you know, just two years ago even. So, um, and I feel like there's a, a disconnect on the uh, benefits of uh, the SASH and Blueprint programs. I know that um, when we've done site visits, it seems to really make a difference. And I get that really uh, by putting it into the ACO, it's affecting more than just those areas that are participating in the ACO. So I get that side of the argument, but I'm not sure if I get any other part of the argument. And so that's something I'm still trying to dig to the bottom of um, to fully understand, because it seems like if you can prove that these are winning programs, and, and certainly all the analysis that we've seen to date um, have shown that they're winning programs. And that's what we should be endorsing is winning programs, whether it's, you know, programs that, uh, you know, keep people from moving to, um, from pre-diabetes to full-blown diabetes or, or whether it's a program attacking hypertension or you name it, we've got to be able to have some type of measurement of what they're bringing to the system. So that, that's just, uh, me venting that I still don't think we're where we need to be. And with that, I'll open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment? Well, I'm not seeing any hands raised and I'm not hearing anyone. Okay, so I think the next step really is for staff to uh, reach out to the ACO, um, see if they wish to uh, provide written answers or have um, a virtual meeting, and really advise them that if we had that, uh, um, we may have to go into executive session in that virtual meeting, and prepare them for the questions that uh, board members have raised today and uh, why there might be that need for that uh, executive session. Does any board member see it differently? Hopefully I'm just not uh, having any uh, volume on my uh, computer. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, Kevin, this is Susan. I checked my phones to see if anyone couldn't get through. Sometimes people text if they have okay. issues. So I don't I don't see any activity there. Yeah, I haven't received any texts either, and I don't see anything in the uh, chat function. So I'm going to assume that uh, um, nobody has anything to bring up at this point, but they're certainly welcome because we have that open public comment period through the 21st. And we certainly have uh, more answers that we need to seek out from one care before we're prepared to uh, make any decisions. So with that, I just want to thank the staff. Um, there's a lot to digest, and I know you have been working uh, feverishly trying to digest it, and it just doesn't seem like it's still going through the digestive uh, track well, but we'll get there. And um, with that, is there any old business to come before the board? OK, 
Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone. Have a great rest of the day.